Hi, thanks for joining us today. If this ministry has impacted your life, we want to hear about it. You can send us your story at amen at vnchurch.com. Also, we would love if you would partner with us financially. You can go to vnchurch.com and click the Give Online or text your donation amount to 757 230 Welcome to church. How's everyone doing today? Man, I'm so glad you're joining us today. My name is Jacob. I'm one of the pastors here, and I have the honor to serve on two of the most amazing senior pastors in the world, Pastor Andy and Sharon Mead. They've given me this opportunity to hang out with you guys today. That's cool. They trust me. That's good. Okay. <laughs> So I don't normally do this when I preach, but I want to jump right into our scripture today. It's a little bit longer than normal. You can follow along on the screens. Check this out. Genesis 22, starting in verse 1, it says, Sometime later, God tested Abraham's faith. Okay. Abraham, God called out. Yes, he replied, here I am. Take your son, your only son, yes, Isaac, whom you love so much, and go to the land of Moriah. Go and sacrifice him as a burnt offering on the mountains. Mm-mm, that ain't good, which I will show you. The next morning, Abraham got up early. He saddled his donkey and took his two servants with him along with his son, Isaac. Then he chopped wood for a fire and a burnt offering and set out to the place God had told him about. On the third day of their journey, Abraham looked up and saw the place in the distance. Stay here with the donkeys, Abraham told the servants. The boy and I will travel a little farther. Check this part out. We will worship there, then we will come back. Okay. So Abraham placed the wood for the burnt offering on Isaac's shoulders, and while he himself carried the fire and the knife. As the two of them walked, to, walked on together, Isaac turned to Abraham and said, Father, yes, my son. Abraham replied, we have fire and wood, the boy said, but um, where's the sheep for the burnt offering? Isaac was starting to get a little suspicious about what was going on here. Uh, God will provide a sheep for the burnt offering, my son Abraham answered, and they both walked on together. When they arrived at the place where God told him to go, Abraham built an altar, arranged the wood on it. Then he tied his son Isaac, uh-oh, laid him on the altar on top of the wood, uh-oh. And Abraham picked up a knife to kill his son. And you thought you had daddy issues, okay? <laughs> but at that moment, everyone say, at that moment. At that moment, the angel of the Lord called to him from heaven, Abraham, Abraham. Yes, Abraham replied, here I am. Do not lay a hand on the boy, the angel said. Do not hurt him in any way. For now I know that you truly fear God. You have not withheld from me even your son, your only son. Then Abraham looked up and saw a ram, and he took the ram and sacrificed it as, a, as an offering in place of his son. So Abraham called that place the Lord will provide. And to this day, it is said, on the mountain of the Lord, it will be provided. So if you're taking notes or you're following along on your outline or even following along on social, social media, you can title part three of this series, When God Comes Through in the Clutch. When God Comes Through in the Clutch. Now, if you're new with us today, we've been in a series for the past few weeks called Running with the Giants, where we've been looking at biblical characters and asking a question, what would these giants of faith say to us today? What would they say to us in our current um, world today? And our theme verse for the series is found in Hebrews 12. It says, therefore, since we are surrounded by such a great cloud of witnesses, let us throw off everything that hinders and the sin that so easily entangles and let us run with perseverance the race marked out for us. Doing what? Fixing our eyes on Jesus. Fixing our eyes on Jesus. See, I love this verse because the imagery is like these giants of faith are, faith are in the stands cheering us on as we run this life, run this race called life, running towards Jesus. 
Now, the giant we're going to focus on today is a man named Abraham. And I, and I think the, Ab- the story of Abraham is very important. There's something about this story I really want to highlight. I think it's important for us to understand. And, and I think Abraham's story shines light on this thought that I'm going to talk about today. Sometimes God doesn't make sense. Oops, am I supposed to say that? (laughs) Sometimes God doesn't make sense. Sometimes life circumstances happen and you look at it and that doesn't make sense. I don't get what's going on. See, and I think in order to run this race called life, we have to be willing to wrestle with the idea of what do we do when we do not understand what God is up to right now. What do we do when we look around in our life circumstances and we can't really even see God in this? See, I have a starting point. That's where we are. And then I'm going to give you a destination point. That's where we're going to land this puppy today. Our starting point today is this. God, I don't understand what you are doing right now. God, I don't understand what you're doing right now. And haven't we all been there before? Like, God, I don't see what's happening here. God, my my family, I don't get what's going on. My marriage, I don't understand why this is happening. God, every time I go to my closet, none of my clothes spark joy. (laughs) I don't understand, God, what you're doing right now. That's our starting point. But our destination point is this. But God always comes through in the clutch. God always comes through in the clutch. God is faithful all the time. So in the clutch, that's an expression, that phrase, if you're not familiar with it, it's kind of used in sports mainly. Mainly if someone makes the the game-winning shot in the clutch or or kicks the field goal and wins the game in the clutch, or or maybe for you, that co-worker that came came to work with donuts in the morning the other day, come on, came in the clutch on that one. It means those moments where the stakes and the pressure are at their highest and someone comes through at the right moment at the perfect time. Now, the problem about the clutch is this, though. Leading up to that moment, the anxiety is high. The stress is high. It makes you wonder, like, is, is God in control of this? Can this something good come from this? So recently in our lives, Aaron and I moved in with my mother-in-law, with, with our little baby, right? Um, we moved in with my, my, with my mother-in-law because we're getting ready for some, some cool changes coming on. So, so the move, though, has actually been pretty awesome. It's pretty nice to have my mother-in-law there with the, you know, with the baby, kind of extra free babysitting. Come on. Uh, and, and especially because Aaron and I, our lives are so fast-paced. But, but, um, but the problem with having a baby and living at a house that's not your own house, there's really not a lot of opportunities for date nights, right? There's not a lot of opportunities for date nights. So my mother-in-law told us, uh, this is a while, but a few months ago now, told us that she was going out of town for the week. And I said to myself, oh, this is a perfect opportunity to surprise Aaron with a romantic date night. I was like, yes, I'm going to do this. I'm going to win some points. Come on. This is going to be great. So I made a decision. I said, man, not only are we going to have a date night, we're going to have a sophisticated date night. I'm going to buy some fancy cheese. I'm going to get some wine from, from the Williamsburg winery. I'm about to be bougie up in here, man. This is about to be nice. So, 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 I, so I get all that in motion. Um, and then I said, you know, once the baby goes to bed, we, you know, we're going to have our nice little date night, right? But guess what happens when you try to do something nice? Everything goes wrong. First of all, so we're getting ready for the night. First of all, my mother-in-law's dog starts limping around the house. Now, these dogs are old as dirt, okay? (laughs) And so I'm thinking to myself, no, this dog about to die on my watch. This is not good. This is not good. So I'm over here trying to to take care of the dog. I don't even know what I'm doing. The dogs don't even like me. And so I guess they can feel the whatever, okay? And so so that's happening. But I, I handled that. Aaron goes ahead and puts Kingsley down for bed. So Kingsley's in bed and all that. After I handle the dog, I go and I get the cheese. I'm cutting the cheese and getting all the wine, being all fancy. I'm like, ooh, look at this. You know, this is good. And then as I'm cutting the cheese, I notice this feeling on my feet. And I look down, and the kitchen sink is leaking everywhere. I'm like, what the? I actually said some other, never mind. Okay. Um, 
Erin comes in the kitchen. She's like, oh, you got to fix it. And I'm like, I don't know how to fix it. And she's like, she's like, you got to do it. It's on mom's house. Okay. And then so I go, so I go underneath the sink and I'm just knocking things over. Like I know what I'm doing. Water's dripping on my face. Mm, you know? And then finally, after a while, Aaron's like, did you fix it? And I got up from under the sink. I was like, yeah, I did. I didn't fix it. I, <laughs> I just had to go on though, okay? So, so then anyways, we go, into the, we go into the living room. We put on that Kurt Russell Christmas movie. Don't know why that was the movie of choice, but whatever. Um, and we're enjoying ourselves, eating our wine, eat, drinking our wine, eating our cheese, being all fancy and stuff like that. But guess what happens again? Now, leading up to this, Aaron and I have been blessed and highly favored by the Lord because Kingsley has been sleeping through the night ever since she was six weeks old. Come on, I got some young parents in the house. They know the struggle. So I've been blessed, right? But Kingsley knew <laughs> that we were trying to have a mom and dad date night. So guess what Kingsley did all that night? Right. Cried all night. I went into her room. I was like, girl, you got to go to sleep right now. She just looked at me with her beautiful eyes. I'm like, oh, I love you. Okay. So, so she literally stayed up all night. We did not have our date night the way we wanted. And, I, and I'm thinking to myself, I'm like, God, don't you want me to have a happy marriage? Don't you want this to work? Why is this happening? Like, God, I don't understand what you're doing right now. But isn't this how life can feel sometimes? Can it feel like, man, we're working on our marriage, we're trying our best, but then it doesn't go well. I'm trying to raise my kids the best I can, but then they're making some bad decisions. I'm trying not to uppercut that coworker at work, even though he's pushing my buttons. I'm trying to do everything I can to live for God, but it still doesn't seem like things are working out. Sometimes life happens and it makes you wonder, God, I don't understand what you're doing right now. I don't understand what you're up to. This is where we find Abraham. Abraham is just minding his business, trying to be a good dad. And then out of nowhere, unannounced to him, God shows up and he says, uh, Abraham, I need you to take your son and sacrifice him. I need you to take your son and sacrifice him. And Abraham's like, skirt, what you say? You said, come again? You said you want me to take him to the mountain for a, a nice little father-son joy walk and then go to Mission Barbecue and get some burnt ends? He's like, no, I want you to make him a burnt offering. You know? and, and Abraham's confused. He's like, why would he do this? What happens when you don't understand what God is up to right now? To understand this a little bit better, we got to understand the backstory of Abraham, okay? So now God gives Abraham this promise that Abraham will be the father of many nations. His name, Abraham, literally means father of, of nations. And God comes to him and says, Abraham, I want you to know something. I'm going to bless you. I'm going to bless your kids. I'm going to bless your kids' kids. And those who curse you, I will curse. And those who bless you, I will bless. You're going to be the father of many nations. And Abraham's like, uh, wow, God, yeah, that sounds really good and all, but mm, um, God, you know I'm 100 years old, right? And my wife, Sarah, she's 90. She's 90 years old. I mean, if you asked me a while back when I was a young stallion, I would have got this thing for you. But you got to be kidding me, right? I'm too old to do this. I'm too old. And God is like, no, just trust me. Trust me. And Abraham is like, yeah, I trust you, God. If you said it, I'll trust you. The Bible says that Abraham believed God and it was credit to him as righteousness. Then in their old age, God comes through in the clutch and gives Abraham and Sarah a son named Isaac. God comes through. 
Abraham's loving his life. He loves his son. He's loving the promise that he has. Abraham is taking Isaac to baseball practice, and all the other parents are like, oh, that's so nice. You bring your great-great-great-grandson to baseball practice. And he's like, no, this is my son. And they're all like, dang, Abraham, you got it like that? High five, you know. <laughs> life is good. Abraham loves the promise of God on his life. Then God out of nowhere, comes to him and says, you know that promise I gave you? Give it back to me. Give it back to me. See, the problem is Abraham didn't even ask for the promise. Abraham didn't even ask to be the father of many nations. Abraham just lived his life in obedience to God, and God blessed him, and God said he wanted to do this through him. So Abraham is like, why would God take away something I didn't even ask for? So the better question may be, what happens in life when we feel like God isn't living up to his end of the bargain? What happens when we feel like God isn't living up to his end of the bargain? You may be in here and you're thinking to yourself, God, when I got married, I love my spouse. Now they're the last person I want to be around. God, when we first started having kids, it was so exciting. It was so, we planned out their future, and we were so excited for it, and now my kids don't even want to talk to me. Like, God, I'm single, and I'm ready to mingle, but there ain't no one to mingle with. God, I thought you had a promise for me. How can we run the race of life when giving up seems like a better option? because we don't understand what God is doing right now. I want you to see the response of Abraham, though. I want you to see what Abraham does. Verse 3 says, The next morning, Abraham got up early. He saddled his donkey and took his two servants with him along with his son Isaac. Then he chopped the wood for a fire for a burnt offering and set out for the place God had told him about. Wait a second. Hold on. Hold on. The text Text does not say Abraham heard God give this word and he chose to do something different. Text does not say Abraham heard the request and he said, nah, God, you don't know what you're doing. I'm going to do it my way. Text says Abraham got up early the next morning. That Abraham settled his donkey, that Abraham got Isaac, got the wood and set out for the place that God told him about. Abraham got up. See, when you don't understand what God is doing right now, that is not your time to give up. That's your time to get up. That's your time to get up and keep moving. Abraham had prompt obedience. And I want you to know faith is best expressed in obedience. And faith is one of those Christian words like faith. You got to have faith, 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 heal. I don't know. Faith is one of those words that people say. But what is faith? Faith is the ability to trust God even when you don't have a clue what God is doing. Faith is the ability to have trust in God when you don't understand your circumstance. Faith is the ability to have trust, and we don't need trust unless we're not confident about the situation. See, it's easy to be excited about your marriage when it's going good. It's easy to be excited about work when things are going your way. It's easy to be excited about things in your life when they're going the way that you plan it to be. But did you know that the real you, your real character, is revealed when life isn't going the way you want it to go? It's when you get to those seasons when you want to give up, when you want to let go, it's when God will bring to attention who you really are. Friends, I'm convinced that my oppositions are my best opportunity for personal growth. I'm convinced that the things that try to take me out are the things that I can use to get closer to God. And I want you to know your best setbacks are actually your greatest setups for where God wants to elevate your life. The things that the enemy wants to use to take you out, God can use that very thing to lift you up. I want you to know today that Jesus on the cross died for your sins. Three days later, he rose from the grave so you can get back up again. You can keep moving. See, we can have trust that God is faithful because God took it all for us. 
See, faith allows you to tap into a trust in God and not a trust in yourself. See, often when things aren't going the way we want, I'm going to do this more. I'm going to take more control of this. My spouse is driving me crazy. I'm leaving. I don't even want to deal with that no more. I can't handle this anymore. My stress is so high, I think I need a little bit more to drink. I think I need a little bit more of the things I got to do. Abraham got up because his prompt obedience was directly connected to his faith and trust in God. That God was good and God was faithful. Check out what the Apostle Paul says about Abraham. Romans 4, starting verse 2, it says, If in fact Abraham was justified by works, he has something to boast about, but not before God. What does Scripture say? Abraham believed God and it was credited to him as righteousness. Now to the one who works, wages are not credited to him as a gift, but as an obligation. Check this out. However, to the one who does not work, but trusts us in God, who justifies the ungodly, the faith is credited to them as righteousness. See, Abraham got up with prompt obedience because he had faith that God was good, even when he didn't understand what God was doing right now. Friends, grace through Jesus allows us to trust in his finished work on the cross. You can continue to get up despite your circumstance and despite what your anxiety is trying to convince you of because God has won. Faith allows you to trust that God is up to something. Come on. Faith allows you to trust that God is up to something even though life doesn't look like it. Even though my world is falling apart, I can still trust in God. Even though people at work don't see my worth, God sees my value. Even though my spouse isn't treating me the way I need to be treated, my worth doesn't come from a person. It comes from the Lord Most High. Even though things aren't going the way I want, God is up to something. And there's some people in here today that you're at that even though moment. You're at that moment where you want to give up, you want to get out, you want to leave. And I'm telling you, even though things aren't going the way you want them to, to go. God is for you. He's with you. And he is faithful. Come on. He's faithful. Even though, even though you got to get up. You got to get up. Abraham got up early in the morning. Abraham got up early in the morning. I like this real fast. I like this. He got up early in the morning. I'm going to tell some people in here today, you got to be like Abraham. You got to get up early in the morning. And the reason why you got to get up early because you got to get to the enemy before the enemy gets to you. Abraham got up. Text says, he chopped the wood for a fire for a burnt offering and set out for the place God told him about. Abraham, not knowing what God is doing right now, still prepared. Still came prepared. Still walked the direction God told him to go. James 2.17 says, in the same way, faith by itself is not accompanied by action. Faith is dead. So I want to make something clear here. Your works do not produce faith. You can work as hard as you want, but it will not produce faith. Faith produces action. Faith produces action. Abraham did not be prepared because he thought if he worked hard enough, God would change his mind. Abraham be prepared because faith gave him confidence that God was up to something even in this. Even in this thing. Even when I don't understand what God is doing, God, I'm still going to come prepared. Even when I want to give up, God, I'm going to tap in closer to your presence. Even when I don't feel like showing up to church because it's been raining all week, I'm still going to be here. Even when I'm reading my Bible and I still haven't seen God come through, I'm going to keep pressing in. Even though I don't want to go to that small group because that person is driving me crazy at group, I'm still going to go. Abraham prepared. And now they're on this three-day journey. They get close to the mountain. Abraham, Abraham tells his servants to stay back. Him and Isaac are going to go. The boy and I will travel a little farther. We will worship there. And we will come back. Abraham, you know if you sacrifice someone, that means they die, right? There's no we coming back from this. 
Abraham is going to sacrifice Isaac because God asked him to. Abraham did not want to. Isaac is the fulfillment of God's promise to Abraham, the father of many nations. If Isaac dies, how will God's promise come to life? The conflict is this. Abraham loves God, but Abraham trusts in God. I'm sorry, Abraham loves his son, but Abraham trusts in God, and he loves his promise. What happens when God is asking you to do something that seems to be in conflict with what you love and what God has called you to do? Marriage, falling apart, but God, you told me to. Kids, they're going crazy, but God, you told me to be a good parent. The season of life, I don't understand why this is happening. And Abraham says, we will be back. Hebrews 11 says this, by faith, Abraham, when God tested him, offered Isaac as a sacrifice He who had embraced the promise was about to sacrifice his one and only son, even though God said to him, it is through Isaac that your offspring will be reckoned. Check out this part. Abraham reasoned that God could even raise the dead. Abraham got to a place where he trusted God so much that he had so much faith in God that he knew God wouldn't take back his word. That if God asked him to do this, it was because God wanted to demonstrate his glory through his promise. It was the faithfulness of God that determined the goodness of God. And for Abraham, it wasn't the circumstances that determine how good God is. It's God that determines how good God is. So no matter the circumstance of life that he was going through, he knew God was still good. And I want you to know today, no matter the circumstance of life that you're going through, it does not change the fact that God is good, that God is faithful, that God is for you, that God has his best on you, that God is going to be with you in the fire, that God is going to be with you in the waters, and it's in the seasons of life where you feel like God is the farthest forward from you is those seasons where God is near to you. God is near you and God draws close to you. My kids are wilding out. Doesn't change the fact that God is still faithful. I got looked over for that promotion again. God is still faithful. Because God has spoken a promise to you And right now, you may not understand what's happening, but he's still faithful. He's still faithful, friends. Because even if the promise looks dead, come on. Even if the promise looks dead, even if your marriage looks dead, come on, I'm preaching to someone right now. Even if your dreams look dead, even if that passion in your heart feels dead, it may look dead, it may feel dead, it may seem dead, but with one word from God, he can resurrect the dead in your life. See, the Bible declares that he, in, in Romans 8, 11, the spirit of God who raised Christ from the dead lives in you. You got resurrection power in your body. You can speak to that situation and God will raise the dead. I got resurrection power for my family. I got resurrection power for my dreams. I got resurrection power for my finances. I have resurrection power in me because God is faithful. The only reasonable conclusion I could come to because God wants me to give up this promise. God, I don't see what you're doing right now. The only reasonable conclusion is this, that God, you must want to raise the dead. You must want to do something even more amazing than what I originally dreamed or thought of. We will worship and we will come back. And they walked and they got to the place. They got to the place of the sacrifice. Abraham put the wood on Isaac's shoulders while Abraham carried the knife. I just got to add this one little part. Abraham, the father, put the wood on on Isaac the son's shoulders, and they walked to the mountain. This was a prophetic picture of what we will see God the Father put the cross on the shoulders of Jesus as they walked to the mountain. They get to the mountain. Isaac's like, where's the sheep? And and Abraham's like, God's going to provide. Jesus in the garden cried out and said, God, if you will, take this cup away from me. But not my will, but yours. 
It was the will of the Father to have Jesus carry the cross and die on the cross as the perfect sacrifice for us. And I want you to know, you may feel like you're going through a problem that no one can relate to. And I want you to know, God will never make you go through something that he hasn't gone through already. Isaac was roughly 25 years of age at this point. He wasn't a little child. Again, a prophetic picture of what Jesus will do. Jesus willingly followed his father's lead to bear the burden on the cross. Abraham said, God will provide a sheep. And I'm coming here to tell you today that you may have to lay some things at the altar today. You may have to lay that promise back down at the altar The Apostle Paul tells us in Romans 12 that our lives should be a living sacrifice, holy and pleasing to the Lord. That's our reasonable act of worship. You may got to get to a place of laying those things back at the altar today. And the reason why It's because when Abraham tied Isaac and he put him on an altar and he was ready to go through what God has told him to do, God came through in the clutch. God came through in the clutch. God said, Abraham, don't lay a hand on that boy. I see that you are faithful. I see that you fear me. And I want you to know I'm going to provide a sheep for you. I'm going to provide a lamb for you. And the lamb is Jesus. And Jesus will take the place for you. Jesus will take the place for your sin. Jesus will take the place for your suffering. Jesus will take the place for your heartache. Jesus will take your place. And God, through his amazing love, sent his one and only son that whoever believes in him shall not perish but have everlasting life. Friends, Did you know that you can know God, that you can find freedom, discover purpose, and make a difference, all while not understanding what God is up to right now? Because it's at the moments when you don't understand is when you can get to a place where you can say, God, you're all I understand. You're all I need right now. You're all I need. And when Abraham got to the moment where he gave it all to God, it's when God came through at the right moment, at the perfect time, in the clutch, and gave him everything he wanted. Friends, I'm going to leave you with this verse. Romans 8, 32 says, He who did not spare his own son, but gave, up, gave him up for us all, how will, he not, how will he also not along with him graciously Give us all things. If God gave us Jesus on the cross, which is the most important thing, he demonstrates that he's faithful to come through in every season. God, I don't understand what you're doing right now. But God, I know you'll come through in the clutch. Bow your heads with me. Let's pray. God, We thank you for your great love for us. We thank you for your power. We thank you that even though things aren't going the way we thought, you are still faithful. And I feel like there's some people in here, you're going through the even though moment. Even though this happened, you weren't expecting that. You weren't expecting that thing to happen. Even though I want you to know God is saying he's still going to be faithful. Lean into him. Draw near to him, and he will draw near to you, the Bible says. Come, Holy Spirit. Have your way with us. Have your way, Lord. There's some people in here today that You're like, Jacob, that sounds good, but I don't even know this Jesus you're talking about. I never made a decision to trust Jesus with my life. If that's you, I'm going to count the three. And on three, I want you to shoot your hand up in the air. I'm not going to call you out, have you come up front, nothing like that. I just want to see who I'm praying for. If you want to make a decision to trust Jesus with your life, 
On three, toss your hand up in the air. Or maybe you have said that prayer before, but life has kind of gotten in the way and you want to make a prayer of recommitment. You want to recommit your life back to Jesus. On three, I want you to toss your hand up in the air too, okay? One, the Bible says that Jesus died for our sins, that he took our sin, he took our punishment, he took our pain, and he went to the cross. Even though he was innocent, Jesus died for us. Two, the Bible declares that today is the day of salvation. Today is the day that you get your heart straight. Today is the day that you live for God. Today is the day that you move towards God because the Bible declares that three days later, Jesus rose from the grave. He defeated death. He defeated the sting of sin. Three, if that's you, toss your hand up in the air. Bless you. Bless you. I see you. I see you all across this room. Bless you. Bless you. Bless you. Now, everyone, say this prayer with me. Say, Jesus, forgive me for my mistakes. Make me new. Today I follow you. Today I trust in you. In Jesus' name, amen. Amen. Let's give God some praise in here today. Thank you for tuning in to today's message. If God is impacting your life through this ministry, join us in reaching others by investing today. You can give by texting your donation amount to 757-230-2110 or by going to vineyardchurch.com slash give. Also, don't forget to subscribe to our channel so that you never miss an update. We'll see you next week.